All right. Um, I think we're back and we're time uh, for the comment period. I really appreciate everybody who's stuck around and I uh, look forward to hearing from you all. Um, so first, a few notes. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. And if you make a public comment, your name, phone number, and face may be displayed as part of the recording. If you'd like to comment, please select the raise your hand function on Zoom or dial star nine if you're on the phone. We'll take a minute now for people to do that. Uh, and then depending on how many people raise their hands, we'll see how long we have for each comment. So if you do have a comment, if you would please raise your hand or dial star nine. All right, I think we can get started here. Uh, Michelle Tran. Michelle, I think you're um, muted. Michelle, you're muted. All right, uh, Michelle. If you can figure out a way to unmute your phone, we'll be glad to hear from you, but I'm gonna to go to the next person, Christine Soto DeBerry. Good morning, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, good morning to the commission. Thank you so much for having this conversation. I'm pleased to be here and so much respect for everybody serving on the commission and have had an opportunity to work with many of you. Uh, Christine Soto DeBerry. I am the former Chief of Staff for San Francisco District Attorneys George Gascone and Chesa Boudin. I am now the Executive Director of the Prosecutors Alliance, a new organization formed in the state of California as a reform-focused law enforcement association to bring a balance to the conversation around how we achieve public safety and reform our criminal justice system. Really happy to give just very brief comment this morning for all of you and welcome the opportunity to partner with you all moving forward on these important issues. Uh, the mission of the Prosecutors Alliance is as prosecutors identifying reforms we can make that make our criminal justice system not just about safety, but about compassion, human dignity and community well being. And we're eager for the conversations that you all are exploring around the penal code to think about that. As I was listening earlier to the testimony from some of the other associations, something that struck me was the lack of a value statement in our penal code and some sort of orientation for us as an entire system about what we are trying to achieve. I heard a lot of mention about uh, victims and the importance of victims' voices, um, which I agree with. Um, and I think as part of that, we should be also talking about victim choice. And we haven't had much opportunity for that in our penal code or in our system of justice to really allow victims to make different choices than punishment um, and when they're looking for accountability and healing through the process. And so I think it may be interesting, um, I don't know whether it's to be codified, but to have an exploration of the values that underline the California penal code as we're thinking about revisions we want to make to it. Um, ideas such as second chances, concepts of healing instead of punishment. I heard a lot of conversation about leverage and I think we need to be, we need to really unpack that uh, and, and question what it is we mean about leverage. It, we've now been involved in the criminal justice reform conversation and conversations about bail. And one of the big concerns around bail was that we would lose the leverage that we had of holding people in custody pre-trial to work out pre plea negotiations. And in my opinion, that's an inappropriate leverage in the system. And we may need to explore more of those as we're looking at revisions to the penal code. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic about the work you all are doing. We are eager to be a partner with all of you. I can think of many ways and, and recommendations. I don't wanna overstep my role here as a public commenter. Moore was calling in to let you know that the Prosecutors Alliance is here. We are brand new and so you may not have heard of us and we wanna make sure that we can be part of the dialogue uh, on the penal code revision as well as state legislation, looking at ways to find the best balance in our system. So happy to, to be a resource and ask, take any questions if appropriate. Uh, I just wanna say, Christine, 
uh, you and I have worked together, known each other for a while. I, for my money, you're one of the smartest people, you know, in the business. So we definitely, you know, appreciate uh, your input and the input of the prosecu prosecutors alliance. Um, so, and, and I think that your point is, is very well taken, especially about the leverage and where is appropriate leverage, but at the same time to achieve what we all seem to be wanting, which is, you know, increased uh, participation and rehabilitation and avoidance of incarceration. So um, thank, thank you very much. We will absolutely be in touch and, and I really uh, appreciate it. Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Um, Michelle, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Michelle Tran. I am an organizer with SEAL Families Unite in Life Without. And I have a question regarding, um, we talk about second chances and rehabilitation and everything, but in almost every penal code, all LWAPs are excluded from that. There's those that have served decades inside who never get an opportunity to even speak because they're silent in there because they don't have, their voice cannot be heard out here unless it's through those who, you know, really push for, for change for them. And um, my question is, is if we talk so much about rehabilitation and reforming, why do we continue to exclude the 5,200 plus that are still sitting within our system that a lot of them have leveled down to level twos and have done it tremendous things throughout the, the system itself. So let me, let me answer that a little bit. And I don't know if the other members want to jo join in. So first of all, I've personally met people who've been sentenced to LWAP, who have undergone incredible transformation um, with absolutely no incentive, no hope. It's, it's, it, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and of course, I think we all, a common theme from day one is uh, rehabilitation discretion that uh, LWAP seems to uh, take away from. However, as a very practical matter, this committee, at least in its first year, um, are generally trying to avoid um, recommendations that would require another initiative or two thirds votes of the legislature. Um, this is just being purely- um, Practical. Practical um, in terms of what we might be able to achieve. It's not saying something that- uh, Well, it's true. We, we, we have great sympathy for the, the issue of LWAP, but that's primarily why you're not hearing a lot of discussion about LWAP or the death penalty, frankly, for the same reason, um, or three strikes for the same reason um, on, on, on these calls. So your point is extraordinarily well taken. We've seen, we've received a lot of materials about LWAP. It does run counter to all of the talk that we've been talking about rehabilitation, but just simply for practical reasons, it will require initiative and the next initiative cycle is 2022. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to say about that, but. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, Joseph Masai. Thank you, everyone. Joseph, I can't see your last name. Joseph, I think you're on mute. Mazelish. All right, Joseph, um, until you can figure out how you get to uh, get on off of mute, we're gonna skip to the next person. Um, Brian uh, Canada. Uh, uh, here I am, this is uh, Joseph. Oh, sorry, Did Joseph, okay. Make it, uh, I, I didn't see that, that unmute only appeared when uh, you called on me and I hadn't noticed it. Okay, uh, yeah. how much time do we have to speak two, with you? Watch two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Well, first, uh, uh, when uh, Judge Moreno mentioned the uh, LA Times story for today, I looked at something from the recent past that's relevant to the committee um, uh, from an editorial on the same subject of the rise in murders. Los Angeles' most injured neighborhoods need exactly what they needed 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago and did not get a new investment in human services and health oriented crisis response and also more responsible, more responsive, more respectful and properly staffed police force. So I wanna bring that up because uh, for all the work that you're doing and it's important, but it is a, really a kind of a trailer as to are those investments being made or are they not being made? 
and the fact that they haven't been made, I think that's where the racism and the inequality especially comes from. I'm not ruling out what uh, uh, Senator Skinner said about there being, despite it all, personal prejudices and so on that's involved. So I wanted to bring that up and mention not only, and uh, some of you did mention it, the facilities in the community, for example, it's in some of the papers you received. I think Mr. Flood mentioned it. Um, and uh, so I wanted to bring that up. The second thing is a question of DA Wagstaff about victims. Uh, when the victims want to know when the person who hurt them will be getting out. And speaking for myself and my brush with victimhood, but also uh, I say the word when is not answered by a time or a date. It is answered by the kinds of things that uh, Senator Kamleiger asked about. That is, when has the person reached the development um, that will that will make them able to take a, a positive place in the community if they've been confined or if they haven't been confined, what kind of programs on probation? So be careful. That word when is very important. Um, there's uh, one more thing too about brain development. Um, you know, when we so-called become adults with fully developed brains, but, but when we commit an offense, especially an interpersonal offense against others, we lose some of that brain function. We become functionally that undeveloped, that person with the undeveloped brain. And so <clears throat> you become a overexcited, fearful teenager or something temporarily when, uh, when you're maybe committing an offense against someone else. So it's not that simple as a matter of age. I hate to throw that curveball in. No, Joseph, th thank you very much. I think an overall theme of of this, you know, as we talked about before, is about rehabilitation and finding out when and how do you judge when. On our next hearing, we will be talking about uh, the parole process, which addresses precisely the issue that you're discussing for people who are serving indeterminate life sentences. And it's a very, very sticky, difficult question. Um, um, so I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, it's not necessarily years, it's um, ability to successfully reenter. Um, Brian. Hello there. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Brian Canada, and I'm the LA coordinator for Californians United for a Responsible Budget or CURB. I'm calling on behalf of our community. Um, I know many people on the panel said this wasn't a yes on 20 call, but a lot of the talk from the law enforcement sounded a lot like a yes on 20 ad. Um, you know, I, I'm going to interrupt you right now. If you're going to talk about Prop 20, we are just not going to have it. I understand what you're referring to, but we're really trying to avoid any explicit one way or another uh, discussion of anything that's on the ballot. Great. That's, uh, my last, that's my last mention of it, and it's because folks on the panel brought it up. They also started speaking about charging people with felonies instead of misdemeanors to encourage treatment, if I heard them correctly. Uh, we here keep hearing things like this, that criminal justice reform has gone too far. And while our jail and prisons remain dangerously overcrowded, a threat to public health and safety, and not just to the people in prison there, also the staff. And the, the real issue is we haven't gone far enough. And I really thank you all for having the courage to change California's penal code so that it centers rehabilitation, if that's something that's possible and not punishment and addresses systemic racism. I wanna thank Senator Skinner so much for her words. They were so powerful. And to hear words like that coming from a uh, assembly member, a legislator, that just gives me a lot of hope for the future because law enforcement wields a lot of power as assembly member Kamlogger Dove said. And the reality is they're not doing it that effectively. And I really wanna encourage folks. I know um, this, this committee has a limited mandate, um, but when folks mention stuff like LWAP, it's so important and we need um, folks like assembly member Kalmogger Dove and Skinner to help us as we try to move important legislation like ending life without parole um, through the legislature in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank, th thank you, Brian. Um, Stephen Green? Yes, uh, you guys can hear me fine? Yep. Yes, so my name is Stephen Green. I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Nancy Skinner and um, Kamalagar Dove 
for your support in criminal justice reform. Um, in 2000, I think in 18, I was commuted by Governor Brown. I had life without the possibility of parole. Mazel tov. Yeah, thank you. And I um, would like to continue and ask you that you continue to support criminal justice reform in all the right directions, obviously. Um, you know, obviously my main concern is probably the life without people, but I understand that that it takes a little bit more. It's not just something that you can just do overnight, but I do believe there needs to be like a release mechanism. So to take in the account that people do change, re rehabilitation does occur. Um, and I also would like to just, just to keep in mind like the compassion that people are asking for. Like I know that the gang enhancements, they suck. They always suck they will continue to suck. They, they catch you for a 25 to life gang enhancement. It takes nothing into account of who you are five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, and I, you guys know that. So I don't, I'm just preaching to the choir here. I would also like to say that, you know, I've never seen a prosecutor not over prosecute and not use the most extreme measures possible to throw young lives away. And then we're talking about young men of color, most likely. And it seems that uh, that's kind of carried over into our, our women, where women being uh, prosecuted at high rates as just as the men now, if not more in some cases. And I, I just like to thank that, you know, thank you. And I know that you guys are a very uh, compassionate group and look at the totality of what a human being is and that we're capable of change. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um, you were exactly the type of person that I was talking about in terms of being able to, despite absolutely no hope when you get an LWAP sentence, I cannot possibly imagine what it's taken you to turn your life around in extraordinary circumstances to the point where you are in commutation. So uh, thank you and, you know, and good luck and thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Brian, can, can, can Ada? Oh, okay. Um, I guess we heard from him. Deputy District Attorney Paul Nunez, are you back? I, I never left. I just oh. wanted to say that um, uh, I wanted to thank you guys for, for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak. And I wanted to hear these public comments and make myself available if anyone had any questions for my office or for me personally. Um, I know that the, um, the substance of what I uh, submitted, um, 17 pages, um, was, was quite extensive on a few allegations. But what we did try to do and what I put in there was some statistics that were from the AG's office and um, statistics from the LAPD. So um, they're quite extensive documents. So I would encourage you to look at those, uh, those documents, the uh, homicide in California is is um very so, informative so um so, uh, if, so if you want to take a look at those and have any questions for me later today or later on I, I'll, I'll make myself available we'll, we'll certainly be in touch your documents are all on our public website i won't reprimand you for going above our word limit but i listen it, it, uh, we really want the data so thank you you're the only person who pro pro provided graphs and charts and that's exactly what we're looking for so thank you on that uh on that score uh, EJ. Hey, good morning. Um, good afternoon, actually. Now, um, everyone. Uh, my name is EJ Pavia with Urban Peace Movement. Uh, we're based here in Alameda County. Um, a little bit by myself. My brother has been in and out for about 20 years, uh, various times hit with gang enhancements, um, has dealt with substance abuse, homelessness and chronic unemployment issues. Um, so I appreciate the work that you're all doing. It's very personal to me. Um, today, I want to speak um, to the need for quality data, as well as broader diversion opportunities, especially pre-charge. Um, I'll also share one piece of data from Alameda County, then two quick anecdotes that sort of contextualize that data from our local court watching and participatory defense work. Um, various speakers mentioned that district attorneys power over who enters, who exits the system, once an arrest is made, and under what circumstances. And uh, my organization, Urban Peace Movement, is part of a statewide coalition for DA accountability, um, along with ACLU and many other organizations. And as a statewide coalition, we've collectively gathered a substantial amount of data from Los Angeles County, Alameda County, and Sacramento County. Um, we asked for charging decisions and dispositions, demographics like race, age, et cetera, and as well as diversion statistics. And while the counties varied in the quality of the data provided, we've analyzed the raw data, um, compared and contrasted across the three counties, identified patterns, and have compiled a list of recommendations that cut across all three counties, 
as well as other recommendations that are very specific to each county. So in, in anticipation for the reports, which will be released in the new year, um, we'd like to schedule hopefully an opportunity um, offline um, to share those findings with this body. I know we have assembly member Comlogger from LA. We have Senator Nancy Skinner who represents Alameda County. We'd love for you both to be a part of that as well as other committee members along with staff who are working around the clock on, on behalf of this committee. Um, so onto the, the uh, statistic. Um, preliminary data has shown that in Alameda County, we're seeing that despite the many collaborative courts and diversion programs that exist, only 5% of all cases from 2017 and 2018 um, represented in the data we have were actually diverted. So we have a 5% diversion rate despite the slew of opportunities that are available. And we have two diversion um, quick anecdotes, if I may have 30 seconds to share that sure. speak to that. Um, we're supporting currently a beloved community member who's an urban farmer who's done community organizing, um, who committed a non recently committed a nonviolent property crime during a moment of relapse. Um, he returned all property, enrolled himself, and graduated from substance abuse classes, continues to take AA and NA classes, and volunteers in the community regularly for cleanups, supporting formerly incarcerated folks, getting get employment. Um, the whole nine. Um, despite all this, he was offered an eight-year sentence due to a 20-year-old conviction. Um, thankfully, DA O'Malley has asked her staff to vacate his sentencing date that was scheduled for this morning, and they're now working toward a more holistic response. But of course, that came from 1,800 community members signing a petition, um, calls, emails um, to halt this. So we're hoping for an out a positive outcome there. Um, the second related um, anecdote um, we also supported an uncle whose nephew underwent eight hours of evaluations after being arrested from social workers and behavioral health professionals um, from the local transitional age youth program. The young man was identified as a perfect fit for the Tate program. However, the supervising prosecutor on the case denied him access. Um, it's been said um, that we should let judges do what judges do. Equally, we should allow mental health and behavioral health professionals also be afforded that same um, Grace, um, we'd be interested in ways that promote mental health and behavioral health responses through the penal code, um, especially in the current conversations we're having nationally about police response to mental and behavioral health um, situations. I think that if that's going to be happening in the streets, we're going to move to a more um, appropriate response. Um, we'd also like to see that happen in the courtroom and to see how the penal code could support that. So I want to end there. Thank you. All right. Th thank you, Jay. D, uh, Senator Skinner? Yeah, um, you referenced having requested data from Alameda County, uh, Sacramento County, I think LA was the other county, I'm not sure. Did you receive it? We did, yeah, we received all the information. We had our team analyze and we have reports that are being prepared to be released ASAP. Okay, Great. so Mike, we, we should follow up and get that info. Yes. EJ. Okay. Thank you. Either if you could reach out to the committee staff or we will find you, but make yourself uh, available somehow because we'd really like to see that data. Absolutely. I had a very quick conversation, maybe 10 minutes with Tom once, maybe we're back in right. April. So we'll connect. Right. Thank we you. Connect with Tom. Uh, Fatima? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for this conversation. My name is Fatima Khan. I'm with the American Friends Service Committee, co-director of the Healing Justice Program over in Oakland, California. Uh, during this conversation, I've heard panelists bring up a lot of various issues, uh, issues of racial disparity, uh, victim needs and participation, and this, this want for alternatives to incarceration. Um, so I wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, this concept of restorative justice addresses a multitude of issues, such as the issues that have been brought up. Uh, racial just, uh, restorative justice programs really can help uh, give some remedy towards racial disparities um, in, in, sen in sentencing, who gets put in the system, in arrests. Uh, also, it gives a lot of, it, it strongly centers the, the person that was harmed and what their needs are, but so, in, and it also addresses the needs of the community and the person that was responsible for committing those harms. And also, it's, it, it can be an alternative to incarceration that also has great impact on lowering the recidivism rate. We know this because there's restorative youth diversion programs in the Bay Area, um, and, they, and they work and they're bringing down um, recidivism rates over three years, over one year, over two years. Um, so 
I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that restorative justice is a evidence-based solution. And if we're able to add restorative justice language within our penal code and implement restorative justice programs throughout the state of California, then we really begin to heal our communities and create this vision that we have of safer communities. We begin to actually implement and create the things that we want. Uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, this conversation was really great. And so many people got brought up so many important and key issues that are also close to our organization's um, values and heart. Thank you. Wow, that was, that was exactly two minutes, A plus for that. Uh, Fat Fatima, how do you pronounce your name? I'm sorry. Fatima. Fatima. Um, our very first uh, meeting of the Pina Code, or our second, I should say, uh, did focus on restorative justice. We think it's very important and very interesting. The difficult part, which we are struggling with and is definitely part of the stew of recommendations that we have, is how do you implement restorative justice into the penal code, which is in some ways fundamentally at odds with the idea of restorative justice, but it's something definitely we're interested in exploring and continuing to work on. So I, so thank you for your comment. Uh, did you have something to say, Assembly Member No? So, um, Belinda Morales? Oh, sorry, Mike, we should hear from uh, Joanne Shear next. I'd oh, I'm sorry, sure. Joanne. I'm sorry, skip you. That's okay. Uh, I'll be very quick and thank you so much, um, committee members, for, for this time. Um, it was very interesting to listen to the, um, the panelists today and, and, um, and we, we appreciate, uh, this is not an us them um, situation. I, 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 I really uh, am, am very, concerned that this is a, a holistic approach to what you're trying to do. Um, but in listening to um, Mr. Flood with the CCPOA, um, I, and of course, Joanne Shear with Felony Murder Elimination Project, we are trying to eliminate um, felony murder uh, special circumstances right now. But I, I, must, I just have to, to, to give you the reality of what happens when a very young person is enters the prison system for the first time ever. They're very young and they are, it is a completely different culture than what they've come from, right? So they're, they are initiated into this prison system that is completely uh, upside down from what, what they've, they've come from as society many times. Um, and, and what happens is, is that there's also a prison culture um, with guards. It's, there's a CCPOA, the whole culture in prison is different. Um, I, I, I've had quite a few people tell me that they've, in, in moving down from a level four to a level three, um, for instance, in, inside prison, they've literally been told by staff, by prison guards that our whole, what we want to do is we're going to give you 115, we're going to watch you like hawks, and our goal is to give you 115s to get you back onto a level four yard. And how do you, how as family members, how do you try and, and offset that? Um, they're, they're trying very, very hard to do everything that they can do. When you've got life without parole, your resources are very, very slim in prison. And so what, what is needed is, is a culture inside prison to help them, to help each individual meet their own, their goals of whatever they can do, what, whatever hope they can find in these systems. So, mm -hmm. so when you're talking about accountability, I really want to point out that there, there should be an accountability and a transparency in, inside the prison system for that. So um, I just wanna say, I totally sympathize with the idea that um, cultures within prisons and jails for that matter can be extraordinarily toxic for a million, for many, many different reasons. Um, furthermore, from what I understand, again, anecdotally, and we're trying to get collect data, is that some of the reforms, again, they do not, in fact, uh, people with LWAP, but they give it opportunities for rehabilitation and early release have helped move the culture in a slightly better direction. Um, and the talk about the Norway and Swedish models about correction officers and, our, and genuine trying attempts at rehabilitation is something that we all want to encourage. We wanna make prison 
not harmful at the slightest and truly rehabilitative um, and, 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 and improve outcomes for everyone. The public safety, I think is, you know, and, um, you know, people who are in the system and, and opportunities to get out. Um, as, you, as, you, as I said earlier, however, um, I think LWAP and death penalty and three strikes and most gang uh, enhancements that require initiative are just simply uh, beyond the scope of what we can do at least this year. Uh, but it's certainly something as a theme that we're, we're aware of and concentrating on. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Belinda Morales. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be, you know, to participate in this. And, and, and Senator Skinner, I really want to thank you for naming the systemic uh, racism that got us here. Um, this is a very uh, personal uh, situation here for me, especially when it comes to our LWAP community and our lifers. Um, my fiance died from COVID and he was number 12 is what they called him. Um, so, you know, I would, I, you know, listening to everybody speak in regards to what we need and what we don't need for our incarcerated, our incarcerated loved ones. Um, this has been an ongoing spiraling situation and it's not something that's just happened now. This is generations of dysfunctional families that has created behaviors that we don't know how to control and we don't know how to help. And housing these behaviors in, in, instead of addressing them, um, those are, are really strong concerns. I mean, LWAPs, uh, my fiance was in prison about 40 something years of his life um, and it was never addressed. Um, he was a programmer, um, had bachelor's degrees, um, graduated from so many different types of programs. Um, those are the types of things that we need to do, but in, in the same sense, we need to have programs, you know, and, and partner with organizations like Heels and Second Chance and FAM and, and those organizations, because those are organizations, um, the majority of, of the way that they're being started is from um, uh, incarcerated individuals who have rehabilitated themselves. And because they saw the injustice of what in occurred inside the prison walls, they needed to make a difference. And, uh, you know, that's just um, one of the biggest issues that I think that we need to face here is that a lot of times we have individuals who don't have the experience that our incar incarcerated loved ones have. Um, we need to help have them participate um, in these reforms and these laws and, and, and legislative um, bills that are, are, are being used to change and reform. Um, Belinda, Belinda, I just need to cut you off. I just uh, want to say quickly, first of all, I'm going to extend my condolences um, to you. I mean, that COVID has affected everybody in the world, um, but none more than folks who are incarcerated. Um, so I'm sorry deeply for that. Um, I also agree wholeheartedly that folks who are directly impacted um, should have a big seat at the table. They know what's wrong. They know what can work. Um, at our last committee hearing, we actually had somebody testify from inside CDCR, thanks to CDCR to come uh, to, to helping us do that. Somebody's currently serving their sentence. So that was pretty um, extraordinary. And I know that today's session focused on law enforcement leaders. Uh, we have a session coming up with other advocacy groups of families and others who have been system impacted and almost all of our hearings and panels up to this point have had folks who are system impacted. We really try to get a broad spectrum. And again, I extend my condolences about your fiance. Uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, no. John, John I, your last name disappears as soon as I say your name. So if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, John Yaya Johnson and I'm a campaign coordinator for the Repeal California Three Strikes Coalition. We're seeking to repeal the California Three Strikes Law in 2022. 
Um, I have two issues that I want to speak to, but first I want to commend the committee for your excellent presentation. Um, I recently was paroled on April 28th, 2020 from San Quentin after serving 25 years under the California Three Strikes Law. I was one of the fortunate ones who was advanced to the board early under Proposition 57. And one of the things that I heard Mr. Flood talking about was this proliferation of gang violence and toxic culture in level fours. And being an individual who's directly impacted, who spent 16 years in the notorious level fours in the California state prisons, the systemic issues that I see that was wrong with those higher level prisons were the, was the lack of rehabilitative programming. And so there seems to be this culture within the CDCR that you have to work your way down to the lower levels in order to be afforded the rehabilitative programs. I think that's a backwards philosophy in the sense that when individuals first come into prison that are impacted by mental health, impacted by trauma, these are the very institutions where rehabilitative programming should take place to one, reduce the proliferation of gang violence and toxic culture within these high level institutions and to prepare individuals to go down to the lower level institutions where they can receive more programming with a more pro-social behavior. The other thing is I recently talked to an individual who also has served over 20 years under the California three strikes law for a robbery conviction. And under penal code 3055, I think you have elderly people that are now 50 and who have served 20 years now being eligible for parole consideration. And he's being systemically excluded because he falls under penal code 971 and 1170.12 of the penal code. And I'm curious to like know why are strikers being excluded from rehabilitative programs when it's not a, a direct advancement for release, but an opportunity to go to the board to uh, be considered for parole based on merit-based programming, right? Here's an individual that has a lot of certificates. He's gotten a college degree while incarcerated, but yet he's being systemically excluded merely because he falls under a certain penal code and not eligible for these rehabilitative considerations to be sent to the board to prove whether or not he's suitable for parole. Well, John, let me interrupt you there. First of all, thank you very much. Obviously, I care a great deal about uh, the, the, the three strikes law. I'm not familiar with the particular rule that you're talking about with regard to elder parole. I'm going to suspect that it has to do with the fact that you cannot advance three strikes um, sentences or parole dates without another initiative um, and that there might have been some carve out there during the legislative process. I don't know for certain, but it's another one of the reasons why, again, this committee is generally, at least for this year, avoiding the topics of three strikes, um, LWAP, death penalty, most gang enhancements that would require uh, a vote or initiative to make genuine reforms there. Obviously, you're focusing on 2022 ballots, so you know about that as well. Um, so I suspect that's what's um, going on there. And in terms of the programming on level four yards versus level two yards, my su suspicion is that this is just that the prisons and the administration would love to offer us programming as much as possible. It's a resource problem. The yeah. vast majority of people who enter CDCR um, get out very quickly and they feel like they should prioritize programming there as opposed to people who are not. Yeah. I understand that instinct. I don't sure it's the accurate one. It's not my job, but I think that, you know, this is an over incredibly overcrowded and broken system on so many different levels. And this is just one symptom of that, um, of that problem. Um, so, Mike, yes, yeah, Senator Skinner. Um, John, you referenced two penal code sections, 971, and the second one was which, 11? Uh, uh, yeah, 1170.12, uh, 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 667 B through I was the first three strike initiative that was passed by the legislature. And the second one was Proposition 184 that passed in November of 1994 by the people uh, via ballot. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, and so it, it, it's, 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 say that again, Mike. Go ahead, those are the three strikes laws. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, so, like, like, so it's, it's just an issue where like, even with Proposition 57 in 2016, there was this court battle because there was uh, uh, this, this understanding that people who had serious felonies that were convicted for a robbery didn't qualify. So the courts ultimately had to uh, settle this dispute. 
And ultimately, a lot of us advance to the board and prove via the board process that we have been rehabilitated and was eligible for release. There are a lot of people being left behind merely because when these laws are being passed in the legislative process, they are systemically excluded based on a penal code, based on a characterization that one, they're either violent or serious, but there's no consideration being given to whether or not these individuals have positively programmed in the prison system and should be considered for release. And yeah. so it seems to be an no. oversight where thousands of people are being left behind and not given or afforded that opportunity to prove suitability via the board panel where you have qualified specialists able to make that reasonable determination. So John, a couple of things. First of all, I think that as we discussed at the, or mentioned at the outset, I think that there's a, a general consensus. Um, I'm not even saying on this committee, but I think there's a, there's a consensus amongst folks who look at this problem in California generally that you know, needs to be more opportunities for evaluations um, and that the determinate sentencing law really created a one-way ratchet that had a lot of unintended problems with people in prison for very long periods of time. Quickly, as somebody who's you know, drafted legislation that has, that has left people behind, um, including, I guess, yourself, I am personally sorry about that. I know we left people behind. Um, sometimes you pass legislation because you think it's the only thing that you can get done and you have to draw lines where you don't necessarily want to. And sometimes you've drawn that line and you made a mistake and you could have passed more. And I've worked my whole career, especially in three strikes to, um, to address that and particularly the lawsuit that you referred to. You probably know that I was central to that. So. I, I get what you're saying. There are a lot of line drawings that happens in statutes. That's what happens. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, we, I think the purpose of this committee is to help draw statutes that doesn't, to don't make those line draws hastily, to make them as thoughtful as possible. Um, and that we are able to spend a lot more time on where those lines should be drawn uh, than a typical committee or a ballot measure might be able to, to do that. So that's really the point and the, the intention here. So anyway, thank you well, for your out, um, And Before as I said, a lot of this depends on ballot measure from 2024. All right, ne next I have uh, Amber Rose Howard. I think. Hi, uh, thank you, um, uh, Chairperson Mike and the rest of the committee. Really appreciate your efforts here, um, you know, and working around the penal code. I think obviously we, understanding mass incarceration have come to the place where we realize all of these uh, changes to the penal code is why California is leading in incarceration in the United States. Um, it's why California has the worst racial disparities, including um, worse than Mississippi, Louisiana, um, you know, Texas. I mean, California is progressive outwardly, um, performatively, but truthfully, uh, we are the worst. Um, and so I really appreciate this committee coming together and figuring out what that looks like. I think some of the things that we should think about and that you all should consider moving forward in your decisions is that, you know, um, one thing for sure is that we have to, we have to continue to um, stretch our definition and, and have a holistic definition of what a survivor and a victim looks like because every single person who is incarcerated in our prisons, jails, and, dis and detention centers first experience with harm was not committing the harm, right? They had received harm. And so when we're looking at survivors of harm and victims of harm, we have to also include people who are incarcerated. I think we have to think, uh, of course, prison and policing is not the answer uh, to things like domestic violence. Uh, I think we have learned that prison is actually domestic violence itself as a structure and an institution as a systemically racist institution. So I'm um, thinking about that. We have to also, and notice that our, our answers and alternatives to incarceration should not be including more law enforcement. Uh, probation should not be the hub um, and the resource for reentry services or for alternatives to incarceration. Um, we have to think about um, what it looks like to actually shift that spending to community-based organizations and community-based programs who have successfully over the past um, made sure that folks are safe, made sure that folks don't go back inside of jails and have prevented 
and prevented people um, from being incarcerated. So I think we should consider that. And then just quickly on enhancements, I think it's important for us to, to realize that even though we are still stuck um, in a vision for public safety that looks like punishment, um, enhancements only perpetuate that vision. It only perpetuates harm. Enhancements, there's no data that proves giving people extra time for having come back into court and for having um, committed other kind of criminalized behaviors. There's no proof and no data that shows enhancements has reduced that kind of harm. Um, it only puts people let in prison. Let, let me just j jump in here because oh. I'm just trying to keep our time. You're speaking my language about the data. There's very little data on one side or the other. The other thing is, is that so many people talk about, you know, we need to get the justice system out of mental health, out of addiction, out of homelessness. We're unfortunately stuck with the penal code committee. So I wish that we could uh, help with, you know, these other systems. And of course they're all integrated and touch each other. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and finally, I appreciate you know, it's almost a cliche amongst folks in, in prison, but I'm sure that you've heard hurt people hurt people. Uh, I, I certainly um, get that. And, um, you know, we're trying to reduce the trauma and improve overall public safety. Um, and that just not includes the general public, but folks uh, inside as, as well. Um, Christina Mendoza. Hi, thank you everyone for having me. I'm Christina Mendoza and um, thank you as well to Kamala Dev and Senator Nancy Skinner for all of your help in moving things forward progressively with the criminal justice reform. Um, and thank you to all my fellow colleagues who have spoke so eloquently about the issues at hand that we fight diligently every day to push. Um, it does sadden me to hear that the it, there will be the exclusions of the gang enhancements, the three strikes, and um, life without the possibility of parole on the panel right now, being that those are what people of color are majority sentenced to, um, even daily. My husband, I am personally affected. My husband was sentenced at the age of 19 out of San Joaquin County as an aider and a better under the felony murder law to life without the possibility of parole. Um, I do want to touch base a little bit on the public safety part, which uh, Miss Amber Rose was speaking on about the facts with the gang enhancements. There's also statistically a lot of facts about lifers and LWOPs who have been commuted and released or resentenced. It's a below recidivism rate. It doesn't, there has been no harm or um, danger imposed on the public by releasing people with uh, extremely lengthy sentences. Um, and touching back onto level four prisons, not getting the rehabilitations, it's absolutely correct because the programs aren't offered to them. Programs should be offered immediately once someone is put into incarceration to help them in the areas where they needed help, whether it be, um, you know, CGA or AA, NA, whatever it may be. But if they are on a three striker or a lifer or a life without, they are often excluded to go into those programs and often told to them, well, you're here forever. So what, why do you need to program? It, that's not the answer. The answer is that they need to be able to program immediately. And, um, the COs across the state can also touch on that. They often refer to lifers and LWOPs as their piece on the yard because they tend to keep things under control. Um, the new people who come into prison, they look up to them. They are watching what they're doing, what they're not doing. So there definitely needs to be a systematic change throughout. But I also really do hope that you guys can consider looking into 190.2 uh, B, C, and D. It was put in by Prop 115 and it all can be reversed with a two thirds vote. Um, if any other, <laughs> Assembly members, legislators, fellow warriors out there, senators who want to help us warrior this on and take on this fight with us, please contact us because we, you know, there it's not a, us and them, just like Ms. Shear said. Most of us who are pushing for criminal justice reform have also been survivors of serious crimes. So we're double affected. We completely understand no victim goes dismissed or anything like that at all but the opportunity to actually rehabilitate and then get a chance to come out here into society is extremely needed um, well, Christina, thank you Christina, for your time yeah. um so you've heard what we said before about spending committee resources and time on uh, legislation that does not require a two-thirds vote or or an initiative at least for this year our very first year 
Um, I'll also say that the vast majority of people who are locked up and incarcerated in California um, have committed uh, nonviolent minor crimes and spend very little time behind bars, but there are millions of people um, in California. Um, so we're trying to look at the whole spectrum from you know probation to LWAP. It's a huge undertaking. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're forgetting or neglecting parts. It's just we're trying to be as practical as possible and, and, and realistic about um, you know, the, the initiative uh, cycle. But you know, 2022 is not that, that far away. So um, Thank you. Char Charlie, and again, your last name disappears and I couldn't pronounce it anyway. Charlie, can you introduce yourself, please? Charlie, you're on mute. Okay, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. All right, sorry about that. Uh, hi, my name's Charlie Prapadananda. Uh, I'm a former LWAP. I served 22 years, I was commuted under Brown. Uh, my thing is, um, are you gonna have people like on this uh, committee that uh, are system impacted or that have some kind of knowledge of, of what's going on with, uh, with our system? Um, well, thank you for the brevity of your question. I, I, I will say that first of all, um, some of us have been victims of crime and system impacted in, in other ways. Um, so I'll just start there. The next is that, um, you know, the governor made the appointments or at least uh, five of the appointments and the legislature made the other two. I think the intention was, uh, I don't wanna speak for him, but I think the intention was to not to try to have, to have this committee be as balanced as possible, meaning that if there was somebody who was formally impact, uh, incarcerated on the panel, then there'd have to be a crime victim on the panel. And if there's a public defender on the panel, then there'd have to be a prosecutor on the panel. And I, did, and I, don't, and I think that the idea was to try to find um, a way to move forward without being as adversarial as possible. I will say, as I've said before, almost, I mean, every panel that we've had with the exception of today has had system impacted people. We've interviewed people who are actually currently incarcerated. We have a whole session coming up of people. Um, so it's, it, it's not uh, anything that we are uh, ignoring. And um, though, no one who served life without parole and gotten out with commutation is certainly on this panel. And again, I want to congratulate you for the effort and work that you put in under extraordinary circumstances to earn your freedom, and doubly, oh, and doubly that you're you know continuing to advocate for folks who are left behind. I totally appreciate that. I hear that we're trying to find a way to make the system better and fairer and un, for everyone. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh for uh, allowing me to speak. And uh, we'll just say, if I could, uh, one last thing, like what Christina was saying is um, my, my journey and most of my brothers and sisters that are serving LWAP's journey has been that no programs are available to us. And most of us seeing that we needed to change our life actually created programs and helped brought programs. Some of which we were excluded from, even though we're the ones that brought them in. So, you know, just to throw that out there. Thank you guys for everything. Thank you, uh, Nancy more, Skinner as well. All the more shows your accomplishments. So thank you and congratulations. Uh, B'nai Vajar, if I, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You are, Mike. Um, thank you so much to um, Senator Kamlager Dove and um, Senator Nancy Skinner for all your efforts in um, changing, um, changing law and things like that. Um, as you know, um, um, my, um, as you know, um, my name is Bene Vahar. Um, I'm with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, my quick, my quick question. I'm gonna make this fast. My quick question is for um, Senator Skinner. Um, I want to know what happened to 1064, and do you see future legislation um, taking place um, with that? <laughs> You're on mute. Oh, Will you remind me? I uh, I have too many bill numbers. Remind me 1064. 
is the um, parole bill for um, confidential ah. employment. That one. That was vetoed. Yes. You know, yeah, I know that. I've been following it. But I want to know. That's why I have <laughs> Look at Kamala or Dove cracking up over there. I have selective amnesia. Because <laughs> we oh. all have PTSD about those vetoed bills, Benang. Yeah. Let me, let me chime in here in that. Anyway, are... let me, Mike, I will respond. It's, mm -hmm. uh, there was a veto message. The message indicated a recognition that there were, um, that the parole board should not act on uh, material that doesn't, isn't somehow substantiated and it directed, uh, it made some direction. Now, exactly how CDCR or the parole board pursues what the veto message is, is not clear, but I do intend because I still am chair of both the policy committee and the budget committee to continue this conversation because yes. uh, the um, evidence that I have documented of the number of cases where the information that was printed at the parole board was the first time the individual, the incarcerated individual who was then before the parole board had ever even heard of the allegation. And that to me is just to, to be held up or to be, um, you know, uh, raised an issue around, you know, what, why did you behave this way or something when you had never, ever heard of that allegation, right. just me patently unfair. So I, I do, I'm going to continue to pursue it, whether mm -hmm. I do it through another law or not, I'm not clear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, just to let you know, Silicon Valley debug is standing with you in that fight. Um, we are system impacted as well. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, committee. Certainly. Um, I also add, tune in to our next committee hearing on November in November where uh, Jennifer Schaefer will be testifying uh, and talking about the parole process generally. Also, uh, Keith Watley, who is intimately involved in all this legislation. So, uh, you know, stay tuned. What, what's that? What's that date, Mike? It's in November. I don't know the exact date. Middle end of November. If you go to our website, um, is there. it is it from the is it from the three strike Stanford or is it going to be from Tom? From the committee. From the committee. The Penal Code Committee. Okay. And um, Mike, yeah. I I'm only interrupting you. I have to go to the dentist, so I didn't want those who are still going to speak <laughs> for public hearing to think that I am not interested in them. I do want to hear from you, but I have to go to the dentist. I think we made it to the end. And, um, you know, I hope, you know, keep all your teeth in your head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 unless I hear, see any more public comment. Uh, there was just, one last person, Mike. We had uh, Cheryl, who I um, was ready to go for it. Okay, think. Cheryl. And, and, and Senator, uh, if you have to go, I completely understand. Good luck. Hope it's not too painful. Hi, my name is Cheryl, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I understand that this is based on the pinnacle, but just um, listening to the whole thing, the whole, you know, your assembly today, and it was interesting. And I was glad to hear all this. And um, earlier, gentleman from LA, it was the uh, prosecutor in LA. And I just wanted to touch base on what he was speaking like earlier. Um, he was discussing his record of prosecuting police officers and and um, cops left, um, you know, they were left off the hook for certain things. So, you know, we need the pinnacle, you know, to kind of apply equally up now to the states for police officers who commit assault, murder, and other abuses of power. And the reason why I'm initiating this, and I know that you may not want to comment on it, but the reason why, because I am a mother. We lost you, Cheryl. Can she call back in? Maybe yeah, she froze. She the good part. Um, that officers from being oh, here. Cheryl, Cheryl, sorry, yeah. we lost you for about five seconds. Can you go back to say that you're a mother and- Oh love? yeah, I'm a mother and I also lost my son to three officers that had taken his life. So that's why I was just trying to speak on it because I was just trying to get your aspect, your opinion to see you may not want to comment, but just- Sorry, we lost you again. What was the last thing that you said? Uh, 
All right, Cheryl, I'm going to try to interpret to the same rules as the rest of us. Okay, Cheryl, you, you, yes. dipped, you dipped in and out there at the reception. Oh, but sorry. I apologize. Um, I apologize. I'm sorry. I was stating that we also need to change any aspect of the pinnacle that prevents officers from being held accountable to the same rules that the rest of us are held to. I, I, I hear that. And that was the gist of what I was getting at. Um, I let know me she go. said she had a son who was murdered. Yes. My son's life was taken by police officers. Yes. First of all, I think I'm going to extend my condolences and, you know, obviously we don't know the circumstances and um, I just can't, as a parent, I just can't imagine um, the grief. So, um, and that you're also channeling that grief coming into participating today and it seems like you're interested in these issues in general is extremely encouraging. Um, so thank you for that. Let me explain to you a little bit about um, how the committee has organized itself and why we're not directly addressing that issue, at least this year. Um, of course, um, officers who commit misconduct are um, subject to criminal sanction and that is within the penal code and should is part of our jurisdiction. We decided to spend this first year um, of the committee to concentrate on sentences, on criminal sentences, their lengths of sentences, again, starting at probation, and deferred uh, judgment all the way up to life sentences, which we will be talking about at our next hearing. The other I the issues that you bring up about substantive uh, criminal sanctions against law enforcement officers, there's been recent reforms to that I'm aware of, but it's not really the focus of our study at least this year. I think when we start, when we sit down to think about our agenda for next year, those types of issues may be on our our focus, especially obviously in the wake of this summer. Um, you know, the issue has always been on, on my radar and I think all of our radars, but it really became obviously an issue of national significance this summer, which um, for good reason, I think. Um, and uh, simply to say that just because we're not addressing it this year does not mean that it's not on our radars. Our committee is a, a standing committee that is, does not expire after this year. And this year we just decided to take on uh, sentencing as, as best we could. So again, uh, thank you uh, for your comment. I don't know if Assembly Member Kamlager or Judge Espinoza, you have any closing thoughts or comments? Peter? No, Sorry, it's always I had, good I to hear from um, the public and another robust discussion. Yeah, yeah, this was a very, very full day. Lots of notes, lots of good ideas. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you all, especially for the folks who have been here since the beginning in these really strange circumstances. We work very hard. The committee works very hard. Staff works very hard to compile uh, and our, our panels. And everything is on YouTube, going back to our first uh, committee hearing to hear from We've now heard from, I think, 60 witnesses from across the spectrum, and uh, that does not include uh, members of the public. We're really sort of getting up to speed in our first year. Thank you so much. We'll have another hearing next week focusing on life sentences and reentry. Please come and tune in for that. Thank you all. Um, our committee staff remain available in the interims for folks who have data and other information or questions. We will also be reaching out to other organizations and stakeholders for your input and help. Um, thank you all, stay safe. And um, uh, with that, uh, this this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, just one, one quick correction, Mike. You said the next meeting was next week. It's next month. I'm sure that's what you meant, just in case anyone is confused. Uh, in November. I was confused. I was too. And I had actually thought we had today and tomorrow. So I had to check my but it's not. Well, Everyone's confused. Everyone on our website for the medical yeah. question email about our uh, uh, our Marina, Can't hear you, Mike. You're breaking up really bad. I can't hear you. Oh, you're back on now. I'm back on. Okay. 
Justice Moreno, uh, yeah. we're about to leave unless you have any last words of wisdom. No. Nope. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks, everybody online. Thank you to <laughs> our folks. Hello to my son. <laughs> um, all right. Have, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.